Okay, let's continue on with our intro unit of biology. And that takes us to something that you've probably been learning since you were like six years old, which is the scientific method. Now, you're probably so sick of hearing about the scientific method at this point, and I get it. It's, it's overkill in some respects, but I got to say the scientific method is extremely important and not just in science, in any decision making. So let's talk about it for a little bit here. What do you say? All right, so what is the scientific method? Well, here is a very, very long-winded definition, right? It's the steps someone takes to identify a question, develop a hypothesis, design and carry out steps or procedures to test the hypothesis, and document observations and findings to share with someone else. That is a whole lot of words to say something very simple. It is essentially a way to solve a problem. Now, it's a way to solve a problem, though, in a way that you know you came up with the best possible solution and one that you can repeat over and over again. So let's talk a little more about the steps of the scientific method. There are, depending on where you look, different textbooks and different sources have a different number of steps. So I'm going to go through what we use um, in our school. But, you know, you might hear an extra step here or there, depending on where you hear it from. So let's go through it. So the whole point of the scientific method is to solve a problem, right? So the first thing that you need is you need a problem. So you have to identify what that problem is. It could be something as simple as what clothes you want to wear for the day, uh, what you should eat for lunch, or something a lot more complex is, you know, how do you stop COVID-19, right? So there's many different levels of problems, but I argue you can use the scientific method to solve any of them. So your next step is going to be to research and gather information. Now, this is a step that a lot of times gets forgotten by people when they list out the steps of the scientific method. And it's a really important step. In order to come up with a good solution for a problem, you need to really understand the problem. You also don't want to come up with a solution that's already been figured out, right? So if you, you know, have a problem you're trying to solve and you come up with this very elaborate way to solve it and it turns out somebody already did that work, you just wasted a whole lot of energy and time. So there's no way to come up with a good solution unless you put some research in. Figure out all the possible scenarios that could occur and then come up with what is called the next step, which is going to be forming a hypothesis. Now, you've all heard that term many, many times, right? What's a hypothesis? An educated guess, right? We all know that, but what is an educated guess, right? Well, the educated part comes from the research gather information, right? You can't come up with a good possible guess as to what could be the problem if you don't have the research done. So a hypothesis has to be researched but it also has to be testable, okay? What do I mean by that? Well, in order for you to have a hypothesis, you have to be able to test if it's right or wrong. If I realize that my car's missing, right? I go outside and my car's not there. If my hypothesis is that aliens came down in the middle of the night, zapped my car away, and it's never gonna be found again, that is not a testable hypothesis. I have no way of knowing if that happened or not, right? So a hypothesis has to be something you can actually test. So state your problem, do your research on your problem, come up with your hypothesis. The next step is to test that hypothesis, right? So you're gonna perform an experiment. And what's very important is that you're gonna perform a controlled experiment. And I'm gonna talk a little more about what that means on the next slide. So the next step is to perform your experiment. So you come up with your hypothesis, what you think might be the problem, and then you do an experiment to tell whether or not your hypothesis was correct or incorrect. Once you perform your experiment, the next step is you have to gather the information. Now, in a lot of labs, this is done with very, very complex lab equipment. But gathering information could just be an observation. What does it look like? What did it do? What happened? So you perform your experiment, and once your experiment is done, and while it's being done, you're going to be gathering information, right? Writing down results of the experiment. The next step is once you have your results, you're going to analyze those results. So if my experiment was keeping track of temperature or um, was keeping track of water level or whatever the scenario is, I'm going to look at my results and I'm going to take some information from them. A lot of times this involves making graphs and analyzing those graphs and taking that information and going to our final step, which is a conclusion. Now a conclusion should always reflect the hypothesis. What does that mean? In my class, I want every conclusion to be started the same way. 
my hypothesis was correct because or my hypothesis was incorrect because. That is a good conclusion because you're going back to the hypothesis and you're reflecting on whether or not it was correct and you're going to say why. Now, one thing I want to make clear, a failed experiment is not a bad thing. Let's say I came up with a hypothesis and it turned out I was completely wrong. That's okay. That just means you got to come up with a new hypothesis. Scientists spend years trying to solve the same problem and they come up with probably hundreds of hypotheses over their careers for the same problem. Because if it doesn't work, they got to come up with a new one. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's the beauty of science. Science is just a process. And you're going to be wrong sometimes. And that's a good thing because you learn from being wrong. And then you take that information to come up with a better hypothesis. So let's go a little further into some of these parts of the scientific method. Okay. So the next thing we're going to be talking about is a control group. When you're designing an experiment, you need to compare things to each other, right? So for example, let's say I want to know if I run faster with shoes on or barefoot. I can't, and my hypothesis is I run faster with shoes on. And I do my experiment and my experiment involves me just running with shoes on. That is not a good experiment because I have nothing to compare it to. I don't know if I actually do run faster with shoes on. I just ran once, right? I need to run at least two times, once with shoes and once without. So a control group is going to be the thing that you're comparing everything else to, right? It's the standard. Every experiment needs a control group. So when you're coming up with different groups that you're comparing together, one of those has to be the standard in which you make no changes compared to the rest of the experiment. So for example, if I want to run, see if I run faster in sneakers versus shoes, I should have a third control group where I run with no shoes at all, right? Barefoot. And that control group is how I'm going to compare the sneakers and the shoes. So it's really important to have a control group. The next thing we're going to talk about are variables. And this tends to be confusing for people. There's something called an independent variable, and there's something called a dependent variable. The words help out, okay? So if I say I'm an independent person, that means I don't get affected by other people. I have a job. I make my own money. I don't rely on anyone. If somebody else changes, I don't change. I do my own thing, right? If I'm a dependent person, I need other people. And if they change, I'm probably going to change with them. I don't have a job. I need someone to feed me, right? So dependent means you rely on other people. Independent means you don't. Well, that's exactly what independent and dependent variables are. A variable is just something that affects your experiment, right? So come up with any experiment. You're going to come up with some variables. Variables are also things that affect in general, right? So for example, what are some of the variables in your life? Well, your parents are variables, right? Because they impact your daily you know, your daily lives. Your friends are variables. Where you live is a variable. All these different things impact your life. Well, the same thing is true for variables with an experiment. So the first one is an independent variable. And an independent variable is the one that you control as the experimenter. It's the one that is going to impact something else. So the independent variable does not change based on the experiment. The dependent variable, on the other hand, depends on other things. So for example, like a dependent person relies on something else. The dependent variable is the one that the experimenter has no control over. So for example, if I go back to my running example, right? If I want to see if I run faster uh, in shoes versus sneakers, the independent variable is the the footwear, what am I actually wearing? I control that. I put on my sneakers. I put on my shoes. The dependent variable is how fast I run. I can't control that. So a good way to think of it is if I run faster, my shoes don't change, right? If I'm running faster, my shoes don't. Okay, let's do a little experiment and see if we can identify uh, some of these terms that we just went over. So we're going to run an experiment and we're going to look and see how fertilizer affects the height of plants. And we're going to take four plants and we're going to measure those four plants over a month. And we're going to set this experiment up in a way that we can determine the impact of these, the fertilizer, right? So in the first plant, we're going to put 10 grams of fertilizer. In the second plant, we're going to put 20 grams. In the third plant, we're going to put 30. And in the fourth, we're going to put zero. Everything else is going to be kept the same. They're going to get the same amount of sunlight, soil, water. They're in the same type of pot. The only difference is how much fertilizer they have. 
So let's take a look at some of these terms and see if we can figure out what's going on here. So the first question I have is, which of those four plants is going to be the control group, right? Well, we have a 30 gram plant, we have the 20 gram plant, the 10 gram plant, and zero. So just first think for a second and see if you can come up with the answer. If you said the fourth plant with no fertilizer, that is the correct answer because we didn't add anything to it. So we can compare the height of the other plants to that plant. The next question we have is, what was the independent variable in this experiment? So, you know, take a second to think about it. What's the variable that we controlled that impacted other things? If you said the amount of fertilizer, you are correct, right? Because the fertilizer determines how the, uh, the change of the height, right? And that leads us to our last question, which is, what was the dependent variable? Which of the variables changed based on the other variables? So think about it for a sec. And the answer is, that's right, the amount it grew because you can't control that. That changes based off of the actual amount of fertilizer. Okay, that's the scientific method in 11 minutes. Thank you.